Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps we can uh, start this evening's uh, lecture. Um, can I begin by extending a very warm welcome to all of you here this evening for what I know is going to be a very interesting lecture and uh, inaugural presentation from our new professor. Um, as I always say at the beginning of these events, inaugural lectures are in part about the new professor uh, demonstrating their expertise and, and knowledge in their specialist field. But the, the aim really is to reach out to a diverse group of audiences, so academic peers, uh, colleagues in other disciplines across the university, students, members of the, the general public outside. And also, I'm very clear that one of the um, uh, key features of inaugural lectures is there an opportunity for family and friends to come along and support and celebrate the success of their family member. So I'm particularly delighted to welcome members of David's family and some friends here as well this evening to, to be here for tonight's special occasion. Um, David will be well known to you. David has been at Keele for probably more years than he would wish to, <laughs> wish to list because he came to Keele after completing his PhD at the University of Manchester and I believe there may even be some Manchester colleagues here in the, in the audience. But David came here in, in 1984 and has pursued a career as from research fellow to lecturer to senior lecturer to reader and now to professor. Um, and during that time has been a very distinguished member of various, various named departments, but the, the, what is now life sciences. And David's main research interests lie in the field of auditory neuroscience. He's presently investigating the role of fibrocytes in the cochlea, and these are the cells that are associated with homeostatic mechanisms that regulate the composition of cochlear fluids. And these cells appear to go wrong in certain forms of deafness, including age-related deafness. His research group has received funding from Deafness Research UK to investigate whether stem cell replacement cell strategy might be employed to prevent or ameliorate this age-related deafness by replacing defective fibrocytes. Now, the main techniques employed in this are the use of the electron microscope. And David has, uh, for many years, been the director of the Keele University Electron Microscope Unit, uh, where he's uh, provided very distinguished service and uh, research and teaching as well. So that's an, another very strong facet of, of David's profile. Um, in terms of the outside world, uh, David has a, has a very strong recognition from the professional audiences and bodies that he engages with. He's been secretary and trustee of the British Society of Audiology, and he was re-elected to those senior roles in 2013, including responsibility for the governance of that society and management of their, their secretariat. He's chair of the BSA Staffing Committee and their Research Grants Awards Committee. And he's also got the distinction of having been invited to revise the chapter on the inner ear in that uh, classic tome of anatomy, Gray's Anatomy. And that, I think, is a very distinguished uh, accolade and a great recognition of, of David's profile in this particular sphere. And it's not just research, though, which is his, his uh, forte, and he has a very strong reputation for his teaching excellence, and he's been nominated uh, on a number of occasions for a teaching excellence award by the students that he works with. Now, in tonight's lecture, David is going to talk about the fact that the ability to communicate via the spoken word and to hear or create music is vital to our quality of life. Yet, yet most adults, as they age, begin to lose that ability. David's research of the last 30 years has focused on the microscopic study of our hearing organ, the cochlea, and it's been a journey of discovery and understanding of the normal processes of hearing, the way hearing can be impaired in disease, and how it deteriorates with age. In this lecture, David hopes to reveal the highlights of that journey and to provide some basis for hope for the hard of hearing in the future. So can I therefore formally welcome David Furness, Professor of Cellular Neuroscience, and invite him to present his inaugural lecture, Hearing Under the Microscope, A Personal View. David. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor, for that very nice introduction. Can you all hear me? Well, OK, good. It's an important facet of, uh, of your auditory system is that you can hear me. Um, of course, this is a very mixed audience, so I'm going to really be quite autobiographical in my talk this evening. 
I'm not going to focus so much on the fibre sites that the Vice Chancellor mentioned, although I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit later on. I'm going to talk about what I started with in hearing research and how I got to, to grow into this position of, of Professor of Cellular Neuroscience. And I'm going to start with, uh, first, a slight recollection. I hope you won't in mind indulging me in this, in memory of my late wife, Carol Hackney, who was very much a partner in this journey. Carol died, unfortunately, and unexpectedly in February this year. And I know she would have been looking forward very much to this lecture. So I hope she's here, at least in spirit. Uh, she was head of the department uh, for some years, and she introduced me, as you'll see in a moment, to hearing research. But where did it all start? What got me started? So when I was about 12, I pestered my parents for one of these, uh, a microscope. This was uh, much like the one I had. It's not the actual one, I'm afraid, which is lost somewhere in the attic or probably in the attic of a house we've left behind. Uh, and I used to do some very odd things. I used to travel around on my bicycle with an empty coffee jar or a pickle jar like this, and I'd find the grottiest, dirtiest pond I could uh, find in the local uh, area, and I'd go and collect some pond water, and I'd stick it under my microscope. And this is the sort of thing that I was seeing, so fascinating, I really wanted to explore this micro world. Uh, this is a paramecium for the biologist amongst you, I'm sure you'll recognise that. It's a tiny single-celled animal, it's about a tenth of a millimetre long, and it has hair, cilia around it, which it wiggles and it, it, uh, it swims along nicely. And watching these things in a little drop of pond water was a real eye-opener for me, and it's something I really loved. But it wasn't, just, it wasn't just the small. I was also interested in other optical equipment, and so I pestered again, and for Christmas I got a telescope. This is actually the telescope that I got, and I started pointing that up at the sky. And I had a little map of the stars, and I would look up there and try and match them to the, to the map, and I, that was fine until I saw one that was kind of golden yellow in colour. It wasn't on the map. And I thought, oh dear, of my map, is my map wrong? And I turned the telescope on it, and that's what I saw. This is a picture that I took much later, admittedly, than when I first used the telescope. But I hope you can all recognise what it is. It's Saturn. And when I sat, uh, stood there looking down the eyepiece of that telescope and saw this sign, this sight, I thought, wow, this, there's nothing more beautiful in the universe, and it's a wonderful way to be, to do science. And I took a couple of other pictures, some of my favourites here, there's a globular cluster, and this, some will know, is the Whirlpool Galaxy. And all of this has really stimulated me in my scientific career. I really wanted to know about the universe that we couldn't see with our naked eyes. So, uh, so few of us, I think, will have looked at these things uh, actually for themselves, down the eyepiece of a microscope or a telescope. And it kind of got uh, out of hand, really, I suppose, in the last few years uh, when I uh, married Carol, which was about six years ago. Um, we decided we would take the car out of the garage and fill it with our own electron microscopes. So uh, here you can see Carol a few months ago sitting at the, one of these electron microscopes and here's the other. There are two different kinds here, and I'll say a little bit about those in a few minutes. So you can see I've always been a bit bonkers. Now, you might think I'm just a complete nerd, just like playing with uh, microscopes and telescopes and things, but as one or two members of the audience will know, I had a slightly uh, different side to me. Uh, here you can see me um, dressed in 70s fashion, because it was still the 70s, with uh, bell bottoms and a silly wispy beard and long hair, playing my uh, favourite first guitar, the Zenta. And we called ourselves Poseidon, which is, a, I thought, a really portentous name, but actually pretentious, I think, is probably a better word. And we thought we were playing rock music, and I think most of our fans thought we were playing punk rock music, because we played it too fast. Uh, Fast forward a little bit to um, 1992, this is, and uh, the Vice Chancellor's office is no longer in Keel Hall, I, I know, but in, we actually played 
in the cellar of Keel Hall at what was then the KRA, the Keel Research Association, which uh, turned into the KPA and was booted out, I'm afraid, of, of Keel Hall. But we played a number of gigs in the basement of Keel Hall. Oops, that's the wrong thing. OK. Now, going back to my sort of research development, um, I left home to go to Manchester University, as the Vice Chancellor said. I did a BSc there and a PhD. And as soon as I got the opportunity, uh, I decided to try and get hold of or get onto some electron microscopes. So I uh, approached a supervisor and I asked him if I could do a project on protozoa, my first love, of course, through light microscopy, using the electron microscope. I said, I want to work on paramecium. He said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. It's boring, everybody's done that. It'd be much better if you slipped open the stomach, the rumen of a sheep and had a look inside there. So I moved on to sheep rumen ciliates. Uh, these are not parasites. These are endocommensal animals that live inside the sheep quite happily. They don't cause it any harm. Uh, and they uh, don't, go, don't do it much good either. But you know, basically, they live there. And there are trillions of them in the average sheep that you can see out there on the field. And then you get to cows. They're also in cows and even more of them in the average cow. So here I still got my undergraduate project. It's a little bit battered now. And I see Mark from Manchester grinning because he probably remembers what it looked like. And here I've opened it and I've shown you some of my early electron microscope images of these little creatures that live inside the rumen. So um, here are some of my early pictures. This is a light microscope image uh, of something that lives inside a sheep. At the top, it's got hairy things called cilia, which enable it to swim through the, the gut contents of the sheep. With the, my first attempts at scanning electron microscopy, uh, I took this picture. You can see now the hairs much more clearly in a sort of whirl around the mouth of this organism. And then a very high magnification picture of the inside of one of these tiny little hairs, one of these cilia that you can see here. So really, we've gone up to very high mag. And this I did all during my undergraduate project, and then I moved on to, the, to a PhD on basically the same subject. So you can see my early career was developing this interest in microscopy in particular, and electron microscopy especially. And then I came, as the Vice Chancellor said, to Kiel on the 1st of October 1984, the day after I submitted my PhD thesis. And uh, I still managed to wangle the trip to Nairobi for a protozoa conference in a, a few months later. And in case you don't recognize me, I'm the one on the left. <laughs> and uh, you can see I've got more hair than I have now. Uh, and my dress sense hasn't got any better. This young gentleman was on the streets of Nairobi and was earning money by posing with, with tourists. I wasn't really a tourist, I have to say that quickly. I was there for a conference. So it's much more important than tourism. But anyway, it was a great trip, and uh, I, I enjoyed it greatly. I'm not going to show you any pictures, because as you might be able to see, the camera I had was something called a Kodak Instamatic 25. And the older ones might remember the Kodak Instamatic 25. It's the kind of box brownie of the 70s. Didn't take very good pictures, in other words. So moving on to actual what I do now, what I've been doing for the last 30 years, is electron microscopy. It's uh, something I'm afraid the nerd element is still there. It was something that I wanted to do from when I was about 12, uh, but didn't have the money to buy one. And uh, this is one of our electron microscopes now in our EM unit here at Kiel. And it's a scanning electron microscope. Now, I'm going to tell you about two kinds of electron microscope. This one is the scanning one. And basically, it helps, allows you to look at surfaces of samples. And in this case, up to a magnification of about 500,000 times. And when you contrast that with a light microscope, where the maximum magnification you can expect to use is a 1,000 times, then you know, you're into a whole new order of things. 
And what you can see down a scanning electron microscope is just not visible to the rest of the, uh, of the, uh, of the world. Uh, so this is actually Karen, who's in the audience, an EM unit technician who's running the microscope at, this, at that point. And it takes this sort of picture. This is a fly, as you've probably realized. It takes pictures in black and white, uh, but it gives you superb detail. And of course, we often color these images like that to be able to make them have a little bit more impact, especially if you, if you like to put them into <laughs> coffee table books, I suppose is the best way I can describe it. The other kind of electron microscope is the transmission electron microscope. And this type of microscope allows us to view inside of cells and tissues, um, magnifications of up to a million times. And um, there is a picture that Carol took, actually. This is a nerve cell. You can see it's circular in, in appearance. It's got a, a membrane all the way around it. And it's got cells, uh, sorry, organelles here in its cytoplasm, and a nucleus in the middle, and an even tinier nucleolus. And they, these are very typical structures of cells, and this is what I was interested in looking at and applying, obviously, in research terms to the research questions I was becoming interested in. And this picture, actually, is one I took. It shows a synapse. Now, as many of you know, the brain is absolutely full of these synapses. Here you can see uh, little packets, little blobs, which are actually synaptic vesicles, which contain the transmitter, the neurotransmitter chemical that signals between cells. Here is uh, another cell. These are only tiny bits of the cells. To show you the whole thing would, would fill Newcastle under line. So we haven't got space for that here. But this is just a tiny bit of a, of a, of a nerve cell communicating with another nerve cell. And th this actually is a picture I took for teaching because I really think that we should be showing students our own research activities, our own teaching, for our teaching materials. Now, this one is perhaps uh, is not an electron microscope, but nevertheless is more expensive than electron microscopes. So for the previous two instruments, we paid about £200,000 each, uh, supported by the Wellcome Trust and uh, other agencies. This is called a confocal microscope. It's actually a super-duper light microscope used for examining fluorescent images. Now, why would you want to do that? Um, basically, we can study uh, the structure and function of either living or preserved cells with this method using special fluorescent dyes and fluorescent techniques. And I'll try and explain that in a bit more detail. So we use this technique called immunocytochemistry. I'm sure many of the, uh, my scientific colleagues will know what this is. Um, but basically, it takes advantage of the body's immune response, which creates antibodies to pathogenic organisms, to the proteins in a pathogenic organism. So what you do is you inject a, an unsuspecting rabbit with a protein that you're interested in, makes antibodies to those proteins, you then bleed its ear, and you, um, you separate the antibodies from the rest of the blood. And you can use those antibodies to tag things. And it, like a Google map, you can label things you're interested in. So not wishing to miss this opportunity, this is a Google map of Newcastle and the Lime, which I've labeled the Indian restaurants. And this is the one I go to most frequently, the Bill Ash. This is not an advert. I don't think there's any people from Bill Ash here, but it's just down the bottom of the hill, so it's easy. So we can tag, just as we can with Google Maps, we can tag proteins using this methodology inside cells. And here's a one that I tagged earlier. This is a green labeled, green fluorescent, uh, not green fluorescent protein, sorry, GFAP, this don't worry about what GFAP is, but it labels astrocytes in the brain. And astrocytes are a type of supporting cell around the neurons of the brain. And that was imaged on our confocal microscope. But you can apply the same technique to electron microscopy as well. So here's a different protein in this case, tagged onto some very tiny structures that I'll be talking a lot more about in a few minutes. Uh, and those 
white blobs are actually gold particles. To give you some idea of scale, they're only 10 nanometers across. Now, usually, if I was in a lecture, I would ask the students what 10 nanometers was. So I'm not going to ask you. I'll tell you. One nanometer is one millionth of a millimeter. So these are pretty tiny objects. So 10 nanometers is 10 millionths of a millimeter. So you could see that with this sort of technique, the precision possible, the ability to locate proteins very, very uh, down at a very tiny level is uh, um, an important possibility. And we can use the same techniques in our transmission electron microscope. So this is now a section which has been labeled. And in case you've got poor eyes like me, we can zoom in on that. And here you can see again the particles. Now, they're not white anymore. They're black because they block the electron beam in this case. But they're still the same thing, the same solution, same gold particles used to label proteins. This, these are bits of cells, and these are actually fibrocytes that uh, BC mentioned, labelled for a particular protein that's important in the way fibrocytes work. So we can use this technique to really not just look at where these proteins are, but even to work out how much of them is present. We can quantify it. Okay. All right, so... That's all kind of a bit of preamble, so it's taken about uh, 20 minutes. I'll speed up a little, perhaps. Uh, let's actually talk about the science that I, I've done over the 30 years I've been here at Kiel. I've been involved in a lot of projects. Perhaps the, the most significant one in terms of the amount of time I've spent on it has been the basic structure and function of the hearing organ, which is the cochlea. Uh, I've also studied the effects of drugs and noise on the cochlea. Not pointing in the right direction, I don't think. And it seems to have stopped. Okay. Um, now, and as, as was mentioned at the beginning, the uh, age-related hearing loss, which is my most recent project, which I'll come back to later on, uh, is about... Uh, trying to repair the cochlea with stem cells. Um, also, I've been involved with other projects in, uh, to do with other neurological disorders. Uh, and I've been studying the synapses. I showed you a picture before. These neurotransmitter chemicals, transporters, and I've done that in various places in the cochlea, the retina, the cortex, and the hippocampus, all uh, parts of the either the sense organs here, the retinas in the eye, or in the brain itself. I'm going to focus to start with... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> I've also contributed a little bit to Dave Hull's uh, work on parasitic tapeworms. Slight digression. So I'm going to concentrate for the, the next few minutes on the, the first of these ones, the basic structure and function of the hearing organ, the cochlea, and that's because that's really where I started in hearing research. So I think I need, first of all, to, for the uh, less academic of you, try and explain a little bit about what hearing is, what it does. I'm sure you all know personally that you listen to sounds in the environment. But what are sounds, and how do you hear them? So sounds that we hear are waves of air pressure. Um, and they're, they're changes in air pressure that happen cyclically. And these are similar to the waves that you see on the surface of the sea, but remember that the sea is a flat plane, so the waves are up and down, whereas in air you're talking about a volume, so the waves are movements of a volume of air. And they, go, uh, they change cyclically, and you should know that one change cycle over one second is called one hertz. That's the frequency of the wave. What you may be less aware of is that young humans, anyway, can hear from about 20 hertz up to about 20,000 hertz, uh, 20, hertz when young. And to give you some idea what that sounds like in terms of pure tones, I've got some little uh, thingies here. That's a 100 hertz tone. 
swiftly to the next one. This is a one kilohertz tone. Quite a big difference. And then, if I can stop that one, to a 10 kilohertz tone. So this is now quite close to the limit, upper limit of human hearing. Okay. Now I'm not going to ask how many of you can't hear that, because that wouldn't be nice. Um, I can still hear it, which is pretty, uh, pretty good for me. Come on, how do I stop this now? Okay. And you should also be aware that other mammals don't hear the same frequencies that humans do. So I'm sure you all know about bats, that bats and dolphins as well use pulses of ultrasound, which is much too high for you to hear, to locate objects, echolocation. On the other hand, elephants use what's called infrasound to see or tell where they are in the environment. And uh, an example is they can hear the rumble of mountains. And each mountain range has its own signature. So it's possible for them to navigate by hearing. We, of course, can't hear those things because we are specialised for the sorts of speech sounds that we typically have. And sounds can be very quiet or they can be very loud. Not going, don't worry too much about what the 120 dB means, but it's effectively a 500,000 to a million range of sounds in intensity, from a whisper to a uh, noise such as Concord, to put in for my dad, because he uh, was involved in designing Concord. And a wave looks like that. This is a, you have a peak and you have a trough, and this takes one second for a one kilohertz sine wave. Now, the simple sounds I've told you are uh, <laughs> quite uh, easy to hear, but sometimes you're, you're uh, exposed to somewhat louder or <laughs> more complex tones. And Mark is laughing. This is Mark, who's in the audience. <laughs> Mark's brother. Shall I stop it here? Oh dear. I'd like you to note the Hank Marvin glasses and the Jack Frost moustache. You haven't gone. I don't know why the video records are so interested in close-ups. <laughs> yes, you'll have guessed that was Threshold Shift, our band. Now, the term Threshold Shift is quite an interesting one. It was uh, suggested by Carol, and when she suggested it, we were called Temporary Threshold Shift. The threshold Shift means hearing loss. So, of course, after a few years of playing rather loud music, we became Threshold Shift. <laughs> the point, though, is that although I'm a, a modest, retiring, shy person who doesn't normally expose himself to public gaze like this, uh, the point is that this is a complex sound. What you're hearing is not uh, a single pure tone, like those tones I, I played at the beginning. It's uh, a group of frequencies, of many different frequencies, some are quieter, some are louder, and it's changing with time. And your auditory system has to cope with that. And I think you could hear quite well. I mean, it may not have been the best song in the world, but you could hear quite well that all of those shifting and changing frequencies and intensities are present, and you could hear those with your auditory system. So the question is, how does that happen? And here is a... a a diagram of the cochlea. Sound waves come in through the outer ear, through a canal to an eardrum. And a little chain of bones conducts those vibrations caused by the sound waves at the eardrum into the labyrinth, it's called, the labyrinth inside the inner ear. And there are two big parts to the labyrinth. 
there's uh, the vestibular part, which is how you balance, and there's the cochlea, which is this snail shell shaped structure, which is what you use to hear with. And here's a drawing I made uh, of the cochlea, and it's designed to illustrate what I'm going to show you next, which is a section of the cochlea. Okay, and basically you've got a spiral tube, and in this section you're cutting the tube across in five different places, so it's all one continuous tube. And the bit that we're interested in, in hearing, is in the circles there. It's a membrane that winds around the spiral on which are situated, uh, is situated the organ of Corti. Corti was a German person who was working in Würzburg in the 1800s, and he was the person who discovered the hearing organ internally. That's a real one from a, uh, a rodent. You can see the spiral structure quite nicely. And you can see running around the, uh, the spiral is the basilar membrane and organ of corti. And it's the organ of corti on top of the basilar membrane which detects the mechanical vibrations caused by sound. Here's uh, another version, a different picture. The the fascinating thing about this organ of corti is it's got to cope with these complex sounds that are coming in, multiple frequencies at multiple intensities. And so what it does is very clever. It separates out all the frequencies, and it does so by means of resonant properties. And the physicists amongst you might notice here, there's a, a little changing mass and stiffness, which together constitutes a uh, a resonant structure which varies systematically with frequency along the spiral. So what's happening is for a low frequency sound, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong thing, for a low frequency sound, there's a wave of movement travels along this membrane and comes to a peak near the top. For a high frequency sound, the wave of movement comes to a peak much lower down. So it's like a piano keyboard, but in reverse, really, with the the high frequencies at the bottom end, the low frequencies at the top end. And this was discovered by a man called von Beckersche, who won a Nobel Prize. Basically how he did that was to play sounds to dead people. And he would look in their cochleas and he would see how they responded. Of course, he didn't respond as well as a live person might, as you could expect. Uh, so you have to have some active process due to being alive to make, it, make this process work better. Now, that's all very well. We've got the movement of the membrane, but somehow we've got to turn that into a signal that the brain can understand. Okay, And this is where it comes to what I've been doing. I've been studying the hair cells of the cochlea from 1984 to the present. The basilar membrane complex with the organ of corti on it here are the hair cells, or at least these are the tops of the hair cells. Uh, they're beautiful structures, as you can see, very precisely arranged. There are two different kinds. These are called inners. It's called outer hair cells. And if we zoom in still further, you can see that they have a long cell body and the hair sticking out of the top. Now, these hairs are very tiny. They're not like the stuff that's disappearing from my head. They're about... Uh, one micrometer or a thousandth of a millimeter high at their best. And basically they are where the stimulus from a sound wave is actually detected and turned into a response that the, uh, the rest of the nervous system can understand. And just for completeness, this is a vestibular one. This is a balanced hair cell. So you can see that similar types of cells are, both, are present for both hearing and balance. Moving closer still... This is a single hair bundle on top of a hair cell. And you can see it's nice, precisely arranged. Now, how does it work? Well, um, I'm going to show you a model. This is a mathematical model. It's not an animation. It's created by formulae, which I don't understand, in a computer. And this was done in the late, in the mid-90s. It's actually done by uh, a lady who came to work with us, Deborah Zetis, who was a Fulbright scholar. And this is based on measurements that we made about the structure of this bundle of hairs. So we took a load of electron microscope images, 
We worked out all the geometry, and she turned it into a mathematical model that was then displayed on a computer. So I'm afraid this is rather ropey in terms of modern BBC style <laughs> um, animations because it's actually a model working as we speak, although I've recorded it, of course, off the television. So what I'm going to show you is the movement of the stereocilia, and in this lower panel, the response of the hair cell. So what we would be doing would we, we'd be uh, moving this hair bundle backwards and forwards, and in the cochlea it would be moved by the vibrations caused by sound, and hopefully you'll be able to see what happens. Um, So you can see the hairs move, and as they move, a current develops inside the hair cell. And I hope you can see that the peak of this current more or less coincides with the backward movement of the hair bundle of this hair cell. So that means the cell is responding to a stimulus, which could be a sound wave. OK? And what we knew about this at the time then was that the hair cells respond to movements of their tiny hairs. And this causes an electrical change in the hair cell. Uh, and this is, this is uh, obtained by opening basically pores, little gates in the cell's membrane through which ions can flow. So we call those ion channels. And we call it the mechanotransducer channel, MET. So I'm just going to call it MET. Just remember that MET is to do with detecting sound. Uh, detecting vibrations. And it causes nerve impulses then to fire in the nerves of hearing, which the brain can then interpret. A big question that we faced when I first started on hearing research is, how does movement of the hairs cause these channels in the membrane to open? Now, I called this In Search of Missing Links, quite proud of this title. I've been using it for several years. And that's because it was based on uh, the, an idea in the late 70s uh, where tiny filaments or links connect the stereocilia together and actually to these channels, and they pull them open. And if you want a simple analogy, it's like pulling a bath plug out and the water emptying through the bath plug. I know you've all got these silly, pushy things now instead, but you used to have a bath plug on a chain. The chain would be the link pulling the bath plug out water flows out, and that's how the current gets into the cell. That's the theory. And then a group not far away in Birmingham, Jim Pickles, Mike Osborne, and Spiro Comis, thought they'd found these links using electron microscopy, and they published this in 1984. Cal and I decided to see if we could find them. And so my first paper in hearing research is uh, called Crosslinks Between Stereocilia in the Guinea Pig Cochlear, Basically, we found these links as well, but we did a lot more than that. We saw much more about their structure. Now, this paper was a bit unique for me. It's my first hearing one. It was in, published in three months from submission. You might think, oh, it's a bit long, isn't it? But we didn't have the web, didn't have the internet. Everything was typed. And we had to prepare photographs. We had to copy the photographs and print them. Publishers didn't get an electronic copy. They got our physical copy. They had to retype it, and et cetera, et cetera. Three months was actually pretty much a record at the time. Not only that, it didn't require any revision. Now, how many of the scientists amongst you have had papers that don't require revision? Don't you get annoyed? I was astonished. But it got into, into publication within three months in 1984, or 1985, sorry, and with no revisions. So it must have been good. And this is one of the pictures from that paper. Now, it won't mean much to you yet. It'll mean a bit more, hopefully, in a few minutes. But basically, this is a, this is a link. It's called an upward-pointing link then. It's now called a tip link. So we also saw some new things. Uh, don't worry too much about this. We saw some special structures at the upper end of the tip link called the upper tip link density. There's a good name for you. And we thought this could contain these ion channels. And here's a, one of our electron micrographs from that paper. We saw the tip link, 
And we, then we saw this structure. Now, this could have been the most fundamental part of your hearing organ. We didn't know at the time. Certainly with the tip link uh, and this structure, we thought we maybe had the answer to hearing in hair cells. So how would it work? Well, your stereocilia have rows, and they increase in height like a staircase. Each shorter row is connected by a single tip link to the row behind in each, in each stereocilium. We won't worry about that. And if we zoom in on that, you can see them now, perhaps with better understanding, how these tip links connect to the adjacent stereocilia. And basically, the idea is pulling on those links opens the channel and causes the cell to respond. OK. Uh, and this is the model. You've got uh, a tip link here. And as the stereocilia are pushed backwards, they pull open a little trap door. That's our iron channel. In, and then ions flow in. And that's how the cell responds. OK, it's quite an easy, simple model, I hope, hope and uh, seemed to be the answer. But we still didn't know. I'll pass on from this slide, because you've seen it, really. We still didn't know uh, whether this was correct. But if it was correct, it means that your hearing is dependent on incredibly tiny structures. They're so tiny, they're only 150 nanometers long. Remember, a nanometer is a millionth of a millimeter. They're two to five nanometers wide, and they must be made of only a few molecules. There are about 70 of them in every hair cell, so there's not much of them. And of course, another question was, where are these channels? Are they actually where we thought they might be? They had to be at one or other end of the tip link, and there would not be many of those. So we couldn't make antibodies to them, because there just wasn't enough protein. So we tried an alternative method, and we labelled them with antibodies to a drug that binds to the channel. What we found was uh, not what we expected, which is good in science. If you get what you expect, then you're probably wrong. It was uh, that these proteins were down below the tip link. We called this area the contact region. And we found it was enriched in a protein that we knew affected this transduction process. And this was indefinitely controversial. Nobody believed us, in other words. Well, nobody's actually proved this is wrong yet. So that's where we found them. And uh, that's the contact region where we think they might be. And this was showing that the calmodulin was located to that region. So where are we now with this? Well, recent work, some of which I've been involved with, me, uh, suggested that we've actually identified these channels, TMC1 and TMC2. Don't worry too much what that means. It's useful because mutations in at least one of these cause hearing loss. And our current work of a, a BBSRC grant, which is attempting to localize these proteins in much the same way as we did before. But now we know what they are. We think we know what they are. We can actually be more precise in finding out what they are, where they are, rather. Still leaves another question, and what's this tip link? And to, do, to answer this question, because it's, again, very few of these links, we turn to some mutations, mutant mice. Uh, this has been over the last four or five years, and we've looked at the uh, tip link composition and function by looking at mutations in mice, which can either occur naturally or artificially generated, or special transgenic models where a particular protein is specifically removed or deleted. So we've been using these mice. Now, the mice are interesting little critters. Um, uh, and I'll come back to those in a minute. So about uh, 15 years ago, it began we began to get clues as to what these tip links were made of. We found there were fish, or others found there were fish with balance problems. Okay, you can imagine fish having balance problems. It doesn't seem very likely, does it? But they did. And this was because of a mutation in this protein, cadherin-23. And then another protein soon after was identified as involved in balance and hearing as well. 
So these two proteins seemed potential uh, possibilities for the tip link. We found that, or we others found that the mutation of these proteins caused deafness, uh, a condition called Usher syndrome, which is also accompanied with blindness. So to study them, we had to look at waltzing mice. Now, mice don't really do this. <laughs> I'm sure you realize. What they actually do is they wobble about in their cages, uh, but they were called waltzing mice because they seemed to be dancing. And we found, uh, we looked at the two mutations, the waltzer mice and the Ames waltzer mice, which had mutations in these two genes. And these can serve as a model for Usher type 1, and they affect the structure and function of the stereocilia and the tip links. Um, basically, for the genetic people amongst you, the, the two mutations we looked at are this one, which is a point mutation in protocadherin 15, and this one, which is a donor splice site mutation. I don't know what those words mean, but I was told that they reduce or eliminate the protein in the mice. So this was courtesy of a, um, um, uh, my colleague, collaborator Al Agraman and Case Weston. And I was given these mice to look at the, their hair cells. And what you can see, this is our control. Over here, lots of tip links and a nice clean bundle. Over here, the mutant, a disruptive bundle, and many tip links missing. And when we study the electrophysiology, Walter Marcotti and Cornet Cross in Sussex, the normal hair cell responds with every peak of the wave, but in the mutant, it responded more or less with every trough in the wave. So what we saw then was that the hair bundle was disturbed, the tip links are almost completely eliminated, and these currents were in the opposite direction of what they should have been. So we know that the channel was still working, but it was not where it should have been. We did the same with V2J, the Ames Waltzer, and basically the result's the same. A few tip links and a disturbed bundle. So I'll move swiftly on. Same result. So this looks like the fact that these tip links are damaged in the mutations and the uh, channels that are operated incorrectly, if at all. And it confirms this idea that these links are made of cadherins which had, you know, people have been looking for this for 20-odd years, and this seemed to be now the answer. So in 2013, I drew this picture with a, for a, a, paper, a review paper by Carol and I, and this seems to answer most of the questions about the tip link. And I then got a BBSRC grant recently to study these channels and uh, other proteins which are producing this sort of image. <laughs> These are where we think these proteins are. OK. So the upshot of all that is our hearing depends on just a couple of molecules. What happens if they break? So I began a study with an ex-PhD student from our lab, Peter Steiger and Hong Zi Lee, exposed mice to sound. And we looked to see what happens to the tip links. And not surprisingly, the mice lost their hearing and the loss of hearing was accompanied by a loss of tip links. We've yet to see if they come back, but they do actually regenerate in culture, so we think that they probably get better. So temporary threshold shift goes back to normal. OK. That took a bit longer than I intended, so if you'll indulge me for a few more minutes, I'll talk about fibrocytes, which is where we came in with the introduction. So we studied all these tip links, and then about five, six, seven years ago, I decided I wanted to try and understand age-related hearing loss and to see whether or not we could think of a stem cell solution. Lots of people have been trying to replace hair cells because they go missing with age. But it seemed to me that there was another way forward. Just to give you some facts, about 30% of people over the age of 65 have hearing loss, and this rises, unfortunately, to 57, about 50% by the age of 75. 
And there's more than 270 million people in the world suffering from hearing impairment. And this continues until profound deafness is reached with psychosocial consequences. People are cut off from each other. And one of the major causes, which is often ignored, is something called metabolic hearing loss. And I term this lateral wall dysfunction. So we're moving on from our cochlea. This is where I've just been concentrating. And I'm going to move outwards to the lateral wall. It's not a very long journey. Uh, a few micrometers at the most. And the reason it's not very long is because the cells in this structure are very important in protecting the hair cells. How do they do it? Well, here's the fibrocytes. We're in the introduction. They line this wall here, and you can see they're not far from the hair cells. And what they seem to do is to recycle a particular ion called potassium and generate a battery. And that battery is what forces the current into the hair cells and the stereocilia are moved. So the link to links is that this battery powers the hair cells. And the guy who was paying sound to dead people, those people didn't have the battery. So um, this battery drives current into the hair cells when the hair cells are operated. They're there. And it's maintained by a cyclical movement of, of these potassium ions around the cochlea and back into this region here, and then back through the hair cells and round again in a cycle. So the fibrocytes are quite important, hence the flashing logo. So the research aims that I've been working on in the last few years have been to see whether we can restore the fibrocytes, because what seems to happen is that they degenerate, and they degenerate in some animals quite quickly. Can we put them back in using culture cells or stem cells? And we have a mouse that loses its hearing within six weeks, so it's a good model in some respects. And we've been growing fibrocytes now in, uh, in various culture media and culture forms. Uh, here you can see them. They're spidery-looking little things. And we're getting close now to potentially being able to transplant some of these back into the degenerating inner ear, hopefully to restore or prevent, anyway, further age-related hearing loss. So, I'm sure there's not very much on fibrocytes, but it's the sort of uh, thing I've been doing uh, in the last few years. So the people I've worked with over the years, Carol, of course, uh, Dave, who's over there with Parasites, uh, Divya, who's in the audience, Professor Divya Chari and her group, who work on um, nanoparticle uptake in neural culture cells. We have a joint grant, though Divya is the PI. Uh, Stash, who's in the audience, working on synapses. Uh, and Mike Evans, Doug Caruana, also there in the audience. We have a little grant to study fibrocytes. Of course, We've also had a lot of external collaborators, people in Oslo, uh, Robert Fetcher Place in Madison, uh, a couple of people in the States, and some people in the UK outside of Kiel, various uh, of those. And of course, we can't do it without the research support of, of these various grant organisations. So thank you for listening. Sorry I've gone over a little, but I hope that was interesting. It's a great pleasure um, as a new dean for natural sciences to welcome new chairs to uh, the faculty and uh, just to express my personal thanks and enjoyment of your talk. I think I was really uh, struck by the fact that, um, well, two things I think struck me about your talk. I think one of them was the, the real impact that those initial encounters with scientific instrumentation clearly made on you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real lesson to us as scientists in particular, to understand just how important it is for us to reach out to young people, both here at the university and the university's role in the wider community,
to, to young people to actually understand some of the excitement of science. And that's clearly brought you into a fascinating mm -hmm. career. And that's a real credit, credit to you and to Kiel. Um, the second thing, I think, was that you, you brought us on a remarkable translational journey because it could have stopped just by observing and looking at things. And I think that's one of the big challenges in science. It's no good just standing there and gawping in wonderment. You've actually taken us on that journey of understanding the mechanism about why, and you've begun to ask those questions why, and you've translated those to outcomes that, that, that really are very exciting potentially okay. for the future. And uh, so thank you very much. I really did very much in, in, enjoy your talk.